And welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the second day of the Reader Appreciation Weekend. We have today a tribe member, Florenza Denise Lee is going to host for this segment and I'm going to turn it over to her. Well, hello everyone and welcome. This has been phenomenal. I hope that you all have had an opportunity to um, check us out yesterday. If you didn't, please view the playback. It is phenomenal. I am so excited to introduce not only a fellow author, but my friend, Tracy Blom. I am super excited. And so I'm gonna read just her quick bio. Um, Tracy Blom is a self-published children's author. Her work is featured in bookstores from Oregon to Florida, including Powell City of Books, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, Writer's Block, and the Tampa Lowry Zoo. All of her books come to her in the form of dreams and carry common themes. Love who you are, be kind to others, and do all that you can to make the world a better place. She has spoken at schools, libraries, and bookstores, and has most recently created a book about cleaning up the ocean. She is also involved in speaking at schools across the country via a program called The Inspire Project. So please join me in welcoming my friend and author, Tracy Blom. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm so, so excited to be here. And it's nice to be speaking to adults because normally when I'm on Zoom, I'm talking to hundreds of kids. <laughs> yes. So um, we want to make sure that we save some time for you to read because you have an amazing project that um, just finished. And so I want to have time for that. But I want to just touch a little bit about how you um, receive your dreams, your books, and also talk to us about a special um, journey, journal that you keep. Yes. So since I was a little kid, I used to um, dream up entire stories and I would write them down and staple them together and give them to my parents. And um, over the years, I've just always kept dream journals. And so um, I have probably just in the shelf behind me, 10 years worth of journals. And um, I usually just, you know, every morning when I wake up, I'll write down whatever it was. And they're normally very vivid dreams every, I, can, I usually can tell if it's something important, if it's something where I go, well, what the heck was that? You know, uh -huh. different time periods and places and character names and things I've never heard of to where I'll wake up and get on the computer and say, I wonder if that really happened. Or I wonder if that's a real thing that happened in history. And some of the stories are, are born that way. Awesome. And that's actually what connected you and me together was you read a post that I um, left saying that my books come to me in dreams. And then you reached out to me and it was just like a match made in heaven. So <laughs> I remember seeing your bio up on the screen and I went, who's this? I better talk to her. <laughs> Yes. Now, um, tell us a little bit about some of your um, most recently published children's books and what inspired you to write those. So most of the books that I have um, all come in the form of dreams, but there have been some um, that have not. And so it's kind of been this fine line of staying true to who I am and working on things that even if it didn't come in a dream, it's something that inspires me or calls me to create. So the most recent one was about Olympic athlete, Betty Robinson. She was the first female to win a gold medal for the United States in the 1930s. She was the first female to train with men. I mean, she broke through all kinds of barriers and did really extravagant things in her life. Um, so I felt really compelled to share her story because not a lot of people really knew who she was. And she was she was just this like incredible woman. And I thought people need to know about her. So that was my most recent one, but I'm always usually working on about four books at once. So if I get kind of caught up on one, then I'll shift focus onto another one and dive into that for a bit, maybe come back and visit the others. So that was my most recent. Um, and aside from that one, I've 
also been working on um, Roller Skating Ralph. It's just this kind of fun story about a roller skating giraffe who gets kind of tired of living in the zoo and he wants to go see the world. And I think, you know, with COVID and everything this year, I haven't been able to travel. And so some of the trips that I had to, you know, postpone or cancel, um, I've channeled into these Ralph stories. And so, you know, the trips I've had to cancel this year, well, some of those got pushed into the adventures of Ralph, so. Awesome. Yeah. Now you've recently shifted your focus from children and young adults. And um, really, if I want to make sure that we talk about the shift for, for adults, but if you could, just for a few seconds, just tell us about your Avalon project and what makes that so unique um, in terms of your other books that you've done. Yeah, so Avalon is um, a recent chapter book that I have recently launched. It is something I've been kind of working on in and out for a while now. It ties back to some of the characters in my young adult series. So I have a trilogy that's out right now um, that features characters who are named after constellations. All the characters, uh, heroes, villains, everyone has a tie into mythology and constellations. And that's just kind of what excites me. Um, and so Avalon really is the origin story of one of the fairies in that story. And so um, it's a chapter book, but it's the first illustrated chapter book that I've done um, ever. And it's, it's kind of like the gateway from picture books into the young adult series. So I just published that um, about a week ago. And it's, it's like my little baby. <laughs> Yes. And for those who have never seen a um, illustrated chapter book, I highly recommend that you um, get this book because each picture is a true work of art. And I know that um, it was a dream of Tracy's to work with uh, Mary Manning. Um, she was just like our um, our white whale that we both said eventually we would win the lottery and could work with Manny and um, Tracy beat me to that. Yeah. So tell us about this most recent shift that you've had in your writing and um, lead us into the um, bit of the book that you're going to read today. Yes. So um, this is my very first novel that is not for children. Um, it's a murder mystery thriller. It is something that was outside of my comfort zone by a long shot. Um, last year I was um, traveling and we were spending some time in New York and a friend of my husband said, oh, I have this idea just in my head for this story. And he shared the concept with me and he said, man, I, I wish I could partner with somebody to write this. And I was like, well, I'll give it a shot. I mean, I've never written any, any violence. I've never written any sex scenes. I've never written any of that. Like it was just a huge challenge for me, but I felt like it was like this huge breakthrough for, for me to write something like this. And then I ended up kind of stumbling upon Lisa um, in a really roundabout weird way where I saw <laughs> a cover that her son had done. And in reaching out to her son to talk about potentially hiring him to do this work, it turned out that she was the same person that you had talked about yes. prior. And it was supposed to be fate. And um, it, it started off as, I want to say, like the bare bones of what a story should be. And then with Lisa's coaching and all the work that she helped me put into this, um, it is now a finished novel. And it's something where I'm like, oh, I'm so excited about this. It's like, it's a real book now. Uh -huh. And um, this chapter that I was going to, well, not the whole chapter, but part of it is the, um, the scene that has some violence. And it's so weird to me to write anything that has violence, but I felt like I did a decent job at it and I had some coaching. So, okay. Um, yeah. But the floor story, is yours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this story is, um, one of addiction and greed, and there's some metaphysical stuff in it. Um, there's basically a cursed land and there's some people who are trying to do right by what they've done in the past. And, uh, this is just a little snippet of what, what that is. Okay. 
Luther sat in his car on the side of the road, mulling over data as the rain poured down. He opened the file he'd been carrying around with him since the start of the case, as if some unseen clue might finally reveal itself. He slid his hand in the folder and carefully pulled out three pictures provided by Kyle's grandparents. The first showed him atop a mountain, proudly pointing to the elevation sign. The second, his graduation from college, and the third of him with his two best friends. Well, I'll be damned. He held the photo up to the light as a message popped up on the MTD. He squinted at the screen reading the text. Car 57, we've got a possible 1080 with a semi truck at Highway 2 in Stevens Pass. He quickly typed car 57, copy, en route. The further he traveled outside the city, the fewer cars he saw, making it easy to spot the large rig pulled halfway off the road. Smoke poured from the engine as he ran around the truck and yanked him on the handle. He tapped the window and called to the empty cabin. Hello? Over here, a troubled voice called from the cornfield. The rain beat down as he raised a flashlight into the darkness. Are you all right? He called into the towering stalks as a faint voice replied, I'm hurt, please help me. Luther scanned the cornfield and no signs of movement. Where are you? I can barely hear you over the rip. Pain exploded in the back of his head, then the world went dark. He painfully blinked and the pain hit him all at once as things slowly came into focus. First the corn stalks, then his boots. Whose boots? He looked up to the stranger drag dragging him by the feet. The man released his ankles with, like a bratty teenager not getting their way as the phone rang. About time you called me. The pain in Luther's head caused the rest of the world words to be slurred as he struggled to make out what the man was saying. What, what do you mean you don't care? Fine, I'll just put him wherever and you can find him. He paced the muddy cornfield as Luther wiggled a knife loose from the cuff of his jacket and took an eternity to free his hands. He eyed every inch of the pot-bellied man committing his appearance to memory, about five five, handlebar mustache, and what appeared to be a scorpion tattooed on his forearm. There appeared, their angry words entered, ended as Luther put his head back on the ground and closed his eyes. The man paused and looked over the body, sensing something was off. Hmm. I swore I tied your wrists, he said, moving back to the place he'd stopped at as Luther lunged forward, stabbing him first in the chest, then the throat, as he tackled the gasping man to the ground, binding his arms and shoving his face in the mud. I'll stop there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Also, now, what is it like to actually read those words and know that they came from you? It. I can see it in my head as, as I'm reading it. It's almost like in my head, I can see all these characters um, going through these acts and what it would look like, you know, if it was a movie or if it was a TV show or something, that's what it looks like as I read it. And it's, it's everything that I, I wanted it to be. Awesome. And um, I do want to tap on something and I, I think you secretly know what's coming. I, I hope we have a few minutes. I want to tackle back around to, um, the, the beginning days of Tracy Blom, the author. Tell us about some of the books that you wrote that were in the beginning that now, if they were to pop up on people's radar that you would go, oh my God, what was that? You know, <laughs> the very first book I ever wrote was kind of like a spoof on a kid's book. And it was called What's in My Pants? And it was, yeah, and it was supposed to be a naughty book that was not for, not for kids. And I was, yeah, I just thought it'd be funny. And I had someone illustrate it with these comic, like, disgusting images. And um, when I made the shift from that into children's work, I made sure that book was discontinued. And as much as I've tried to hide it from the internet, like somehow it still finds its way and people go, hey, what's that book? What's in my pants? What's that? And I go, oh, no. <laughs> I go, I feel bad that it's still, I mean, it's still out there. And some people, I still have maybe a few copies in my closet, but. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if, if anyone finds a copy of it, I highly recommend that you hold on to it. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's long, long gone, not forgotten. <laughs> now, um, for just a few minutes, talk to us about that shift from being 
traditionally published to self-publishing and what um, prompted you to make that shift? Yeah, so um, the, besides that kind of joke book, um, I, I used to write a lot of poetry. I used to do stand-up poetry and a lot of things where I could just get my thoughts and feelings onto paper. And I started dabbling in um, just children's literature and things that could be fun for kids. And somebody approached me through a, um, I guess something I had entered as a contest and asked me if I'd be interested in signing on with their company to publish a couple books. And so the, I published the first two books of mine traditionally through their company. Um, and then the following books that I was supposed to write just didn't feel like they were for me. They didn't feel like they were anything I was excited about. And as much as I tried to write books about cats and whatever they wanted me to write about, I just, did, it, it wasn't there. Like, I just felt like the stale kind of dread with it. And I thought, this isn't what I want to be doing. I want to write this book about fairies. I want to write this book about time travel. I want to write all these things. And they were like, well, no, we want you to write this. And I went, well, bye. So... <laughs> I, I ended up um, researching a lot of um, like just different ways to self-publish and do it myself and hire artists that I felt fit with my work um, and then really take the reins as far as setting up my own events, um, ordering my own books, printing my own books, hiring the artists I wanted. And it's been, it's a lot of work self-publishing, but it's, it's great because I feel like I can grow at my own speed and I can do events you know, and not have to ask for a lot of permission or wait for all these different, you know, people to say yes before I can pursue things. So it's been, it's been a, a great adventure and I'm glad that I did. Yeah. Now tell us about your experience ghostwriting and um, what did you learn about yourself through that process? Um, so I've ghostwritten a few different books for people. Um, one was for a um, psychic medium and she wanted to write about her, her stories and her, you know, how she grew up seeing spirits and ghosts and everything. And so it was a big process um, learning from her and trying to rewrite things in her eyes and how she saw the world. And it wasn't really just about uh, I felt like it was a big educational jump for me. And some of her, um, some of the things that she shared with me have kind of made their way into some of my work. Like I've, I've been inspired by some of the ways that she's described seeing the world um, and put those into some of my, my young adult stories and also into Avalon, um, especially with fairies and and things like that, where it was like, just this, this magical, I mean, it wasn't exactly how she had described things. I mean, she was describing heaven and all these different realms um, of seeing the afterlife. And so I kind of was just inspired by tidbits of that and um, asked her if it would be okay to put my rendition of it into Avalon for some of the different lands. So awesome. Well, what's new for Tracy Blom? I mean, you've done the the children's books, you've done the naughty adult comic strip books. Now you've tried your hand in uh, Murder Mystery and I know that you've been bitten by that bug. So what's next for you? Um, so during this, you know, this year, not really doing too much. I also wanted to um, dabble with theater and mm. I went and um, read a bunch of different play scripts and books and um, took a stab at writing Avalon in the form of a theatrical play slash ballet. So um, I'm kind of doing some experimental work with theater and hoping that when theaters open up again, I can maybe work with, there's a couple companies that have read it and that are like, oh, this would be neat. Um, so some theater, but I'm also really getting back into um, with this murder mystery book two. Um, okay. I started writing book two of it and I, I feel like it's this whole new world for me to write in this genre. That's pretty exciting. What would be in our final minutes before we get to um, you telling us where readers can follow you? 
what would be a word of advice to someone who perhaps don't view their writing in multiple genres or who are afraid to step outside of the one genre that they're in? What would be something that you would share with them? I think that um, it's good to challenge yourself. And I don't think that people should just stay in one square, like in one box, you know, if it's okay to go outside of that comfort zone. And if it seems foreign, then look to people that can help you and look to people who can help coach you and guide you into what it should look like. And there's a wealth of people out there that can, that can help coach and guide. And um, I say, you know, you never know until you try. So I, it was really a neat experience for me going outside of that genre and trying. And I thought, uh, like there are many times where I thought, this isn't, this isn't me. This isn't who I am. And the weird part of the, well, not the weird part, but one of the weird things about it was I thought, am I being untrue to myself because this murder mystery book didn't come in a dream. And I went back into my journals from last year before I ever started this book or talked to the person whose idea it was. And I had dreamt of the characters and I thought, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to write it. And it was kind of that confirmation that I was supposed to, you know, written the story and one way or another, it would have came out. Awesome. And you know, that leads to another question in terms of how important is it for um, people to um, keep that, that written log that journal? I, I personally like it because I go back even years back and look at things that I've dreamt of or things that came to me in a dream and were written down forever ago. And I go, didn't I dream about that? And I'll just go back and it might have been five years ago and I find it and I'm like, oh yeah. And the young adult series I wrote, The Guardians of Eden, that actually started as a dream I had when I was six, seven years old. And I wrote that down when I was a kid. And I went back and was always just kind of enchanted by this, this dream that I had of this other world. And um, that's what inspired that entire trilogy. So awesome. I think it's important to keep them. <laughs> keep cool being. See, I've always been uh, apprehensive about putting things in writing. I come from that um, from that 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 group of people that don't want to uh, have what is it plausible deniability so uh, yeah I don't put a whole lot in writing unless I want you to know it <laughs> so tell the readers where they're able to follow you yes so I have a website it is theblom.com.com so the blom and then the word d-o-t C-O-M and then dot com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tracy, I am so excited that um, that you joined us, uh, especially just because we have this phenomenal um, relationship that kind of extends outside of, of this. Um, and in our last seconds for people who are watching, how important is it to have a tribe, to have that friendship with someone? It is. I mean, just to have someone that you can bounce ideas off of and get honest feedback and someone that can help elevate you and help you grow. I think it's super important. And um, it's, it's rare to find those people who you really jive with and the people that you're, you feel like this kindred connection to. And I think it's important when you find it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to hold on. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I've been seeing some comments pop up. So Lisa, are you, um, are you still there? You can ask um, if there's some questions for her. She has a few more minutes left. So, yeah. Okay. So if um, anyone that's in the audience, if you have a question, please put them in the comment box and uh, let's see. Oh, going back, Tracy, to your, um, the, story about I'm going to go back up about Betty you're breaking Betty yeah you had an opportunity to speak with the family I believe yes tell us about that and what that was like 
Um, so through that nonprofit that I work with in Florida called the Inspire Project, um, they are doing some work with the Women's Sports Museum that's opening up. And Betty Robinson is going to have an exhibit there at the museum when it opens. And so um, it just happened that I was talking to the Inspire Project on one of the days that they were also talking to the, um, the founder of the museum. And they're saying, oh yeah, you know, it would be neat to have a book written about Betty. And she's no longer around, but her kids are around. And, it, and I said, well, uh, I would love to write her story. And it's, I mean, she, she was in a plane crash, survived the plane crash, was told she would never walk again, taught herself to walk, taught herself to run, and then ran again. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, I want to write that story. And so I set up interviews with her grandkids and her daughter. And they, you know, shared pictures, family pictures, family moments, um, newspaper articles, pictures of her medals. Um, so I really felt like I got to learn a lot about who she was as a person, as a woman, as a mother. It was, it was really neat. Awesome. Now, you said earlier, as far as uh, making that transition from being traditionally published to self-publishing and having that total control of all aspects of publishing, what was it like stepping into a new genre with the murder mystery and working with someone like Lisa, who is a New York Times bestselling author? No, 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 no. So, wait, wait, wait. no, no, I'm, I'm a USA Today bestselling USA author. USA Today! <laughs> Yeah, I'm hoping at one point to be there, but not well, we done right spoke yet. it. Wait, we done spoke it into existence. So be <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> From my mouth to God's ears, it is done. Amen. Like so, <laughs> so what was it like working with Lisa for a book that was so far out of your comfort zone? Um, what was that process like? In in relinquishing that control to someone for um, editing purposes. I am so thankful for Lisa. She, um, it was, it was a learning experience and she taught me patterns in my writing that I didn't know were there, uh, things that I shouldn't be doing, things that I never had anyone say to me, you shouldn't do that, or you should do this, or have you thought about looking at it this way, or um, we need to change the scenes or we need to do like it was just this eye opening learning experience where I felt like I find I had a coach I had someone who was trying to make me better. And it was one of the best writing experiences I think I've had in any of my books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that came with some with some tears. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Why you had to bring up Rosa? You know, that's just, <laughs> you know, that's a line in my book. Why you got to bring up, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, yes, there were some but, times I was like, I have to rewrite this whole thing. It's garbage. You know, but it's, <laughs> I love it now. <laughs> <laughs> and that really goes to the power of a tribe, too, because you had someone that you trusted. And I think that was your number one question with working with someone, can I trust her? Yes. And then to, to know that you can trust the creative side of someone and then also trust that sounding board that you have. So you had Lisa on one side in, inspiring you to become greater, but you also had me on the other side letting you know that you can become greater. And so you had those bookends, if you will, that were not pushing you, but there with you as you went on your journey. Um, right. And how important is that? It, it's, I think it's something that's really needed. I mean, for, for anybody who's going through, going, going through, writing, <laughs> <laughs> who's writing a story. I think it's important for people to have those sounding boards and people that can say, uh, this one, this made me feel this way, or this didn't seem right, or this, sh have you thought about changing this, or, you know, just a different set of eyes on it, and I know that, you know, when you're writing stories, sometimes you get too close to it, and you've read it mm -hmm. so many times that you can't see it anymore, and so it was, 
uh, just the breath of fresh air, having other people that could look at it and give yeah. that, that feedback. That was so crucial. Yeah. yeah. My dad used to say, you can't see the forest for the trees. And I think as, as authors, we pigeonhole ourselves in that we either become too connected to the characters, too connected with the story, and then we lose sight of it's a bigger picture than just um, what we're trying to tell and not to get lost in that. And so, um, Tracy, I, of course, you know, I love you and I love everything that you do. And I'm so excited for how life has connected all of these dots for you from me calling you excited like a, a school girl that I met this phenomenal author, Nalina Kai, and then for life to take you on your own journey to finding um, number one son and connecting all of those dots. So I'm excited for what's next for you. And I'm excited for um, how this road is going to carry both of us um, to this phenomenal destination. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Awesome. Lisa, back to you. All right. I am. Thank you so much, Tracy. I appreciate your being here. So. Okay. There we go. All right. Hold on for a second.